Speaking on this program is Franklin Kemp. The last four weeks we have been studying the question of what it means to believe, to repent, to confess, and to be baptized. Tonight we continue our study of the subject of baptism. What does this mean? What does the Bible teach? Why is there so much confusion about the subject? Why is it that there is so much controversy about it? When it comes to the subject of faith, there is general agreement that in order for one to be saved, one must believe. I do not know of any that teach that one can be saved apart from faith. Why is it that when we come to the subject of repentance, that there is general agreement concerning that? That one must turn from their sins in order to be saved. When we come to the subject of confession, there is general agreement on that. That one that will not confess Christ cannot be saved. But when we mention the subject of baptism, immediately there is controversy. And people are ready to say, yes, I know the Bible says something about baptism, but it's not a condition of salvation. One does not have to be baptized in order to be saved. Is it not rather strange that we can agree, at least generally on the other three, but when this one is mentioned, it's forgotten. We forget what the Bible says, and controversy arises, and we're told that this one is not as important as the others. This morning we began the study by <clears throat> pointing out that this subject can be explained by four simple words. The longest word is a four-letter word. And this morning I talked about two of them. The word in. Acts 10.48, Peter commanded the household of Cornelius to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This denotes the relationship to Christ and the authority of Christ. And therefore, baptism is an authoritative command. Surely, one cannot be submissive to the will of God and accept the authority of Christ, which he claimed when he said, All authority hath been given on, unto me in heaven and on earth. And yet at the same time, deny the essentiality and the need of the subject. When he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so, baptism then is an authoritative command. Second, we explain the word, or rather baptism by the word, by. First Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit are all baptized in the one body. As I pointed out this morning, that has to do with direction, not element. Only the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was to qualify them to fulfill their function and their office as apostles, to enable them to be ambassadors of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and 20 to enable them to receive the divine revelation of the gospel of Christ and confirm that with miracles, and then write it down so that we could have it. And therefore Romans 8, 14 said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In the <clears throat> first century before the New Testament was written, they were led by men who were directly inspired and guided by the Spirit. We now have that written word. We don't need, and no one is led directly by the Spirit today. All that the leading that the Spirit does today is through the revelation that we have in the Bible. If the Scripture inspired of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. He hath granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And uh, Jude 3 says, Contend earnestly for the faith which has been once for all delivered to the saints. So it's completed. 
1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect is come, a completed, perfected revelation, then that which is in part, miraculous endowments, direct revelation, when that which is in part, then that which is in part shall be done away. So the only way that one can be led by the Spirit today is to be led through the New Testament. But when one's led by the revelation that we have in the New Testament, the Word of God, just as Peter, guided directly by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, led those people to believe in Christ and repent of their sin and to acknowledge Him as the Son of God, when they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The Spirit through Peter led them to be baptized. And so the Spirit would lead me then through Acts chapter 2, through the Apostle Peter. And leading me as it did then would lead me to the same place it led them, to be baptized just as they were baptized. We read uh, in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts that uh, Philip met a man on the road. That Philip was an inspired man. He went down to Samaria and died to perform miracles. First, the things concerning the kingdom of God, and they were baptized both men and women. They had not received the Spirit. They were led to be baptized, but they had not received the Spirit. And they did not receive the Spirit until Peter and John came down and laid their hands upon them that they might receive the Spirit. And so, the Spirit led them through Philip. As the word was revealed to Philip, and he preached unto them the things concerning the kingdom of God, and they were led then to be baptized. In the same chapter, the eunuch. Philip preached to the eunuch, beginning at the same scripture. In fact, the eunuch said, of Isaiah 53, in fact, when Philip came to him, he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man inspired man, some man guided by the Spirit, how can I accept some man shall guide me? And so Philip then was guided by the Spirit. One that had received the Spirit. Go back and read Acts 6, and you'll find that Philip was one of the seven that was chosen there, and the seven that were chosen were men that were full of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, leading them the eunuch to understand what Isaiah was talking about, that Isaiah had in mind Christ, he led him then to be baptized. And so there then are three examples of how men were led by the Holy Spirit to be baptized and thus become children of God, as Romans 8.14 says. And of course more could be said about that, but I mention that because there is so much misunderstanding concerning the matter. Now then, leaving those two words, I want to pass on and talk about the third word. And this is the word, F-O-R, for a little three-letter word. And it's found in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 38, where Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for... The remission of sins. Now that tells us something further about baptism. That tells us that baptism is not because one is already saved. Yet the majority of the religious world today have the idea that one's baptized because he's already saved. I don't know what that says. That says for the remission of sins, unto the remission of sins, in order to the remission of sins. There's not a single recognized commentary anywhere that I have ever read that denies that for in Acts 2.38 means in order to. I have a commentary written by a man who taught that people were saved before they were baptized. And yet in his commentary and comments on Acts 2.38, he said that it means in order to. That's what the verse says, and that's what it means. In spite of the fact, the church that he preached for denied that. 
But he understood the real meaning and the actual meaning of Acts 238. It was in order to the remission of sin. Then not baptized in because he's already saved. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, that this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. And the phrase for remission of sins in Matthew 26, 28 is identical with Acts uh, 2, 38. Did Jesus die because men were already saved? Or did he die in order that men might be saved? Well, there's not any question then, but what baptism is for the remission of sin. Baptism is to the penitent man, that is, a believer. And that's what Acts 2.38 says. Repent and be baptized. One that is not a believer and one that is not penitent. Mark 16.16, he that believed it and is baptized be saved. You could not scripturally baptize an unbeliever. Sometimes people say, well, if I believe like you do, that baptism is a sense of salvation, I just go ahead and lasso people and baptize them. Now, if you believe like I do, I don't believe that would be any good. You don't force people that way. Baptism is for the one that believes, and until one believes, he's not ready to be baptized. But not only must he believe, he must be a penitent believer. And it's not for the remission of sins to the one that is an unbeliever or to an impenitent person. But not only that, it is not for the remission of sins to one that does not confess Christ. In Acts 8 and 37, the eunuch said that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon that confession, then uh, Philip baptized him. But not only that, baptism is for one that is not a Christian. Very often I have people that ask me this question. Do you baptize sinners or Christians? I baptize sinners. Somebody said, you mean you would baptize a sinner? Sure, that's the only kind of folks you can baptize. Now, when I say that, I mean that I baptize a believing, penitent, sinner that has confessed his faith in Christ. But he's still a sinner. How do I know that? Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. One's a sinner until he's saved, is he not? Well, surely he is. Well, when is one saved? When he's baptized. In the act of being baptized. Not until then. And so Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. One does not <clears throat> have remission of sins as a sinner. The, sin, the guilt of sin is still there until it is remitted. And that's what remission means, to remove, to remit, to blot out. And therefore... Peter said, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now do what, Peter? Save us. What does it do? Saves us. You wouldn't think about it saving a Christian, would you? A Christian wouldn't need that kind of salvation. It saves people that are sinners. So don't let anybody upset you then when they say, well, do you baptize sinners or do you baptize Christians? I baptize sinners. And everybody that baptizes like the Bible said, baptizes sinners. The people that Peter baptized on Pentecost were every one sinners. Because they were baptized in order that their sins might be remitted. And until they were remitted, they were sinners. Let us then not become confused about the matter and let somebody disturb and upset us. So... Baptism, then, is related to Christ by authority, the Spirit by direction, and the salvation by purpose. What is the purpose of baptism? In order that one might be saved. And those that want to be saved, then, are baptized in order that God, through Christ and His blood, might remit their sins and thereby extend to them the salvation 
for which Jesus came into the world to bring to me. Let us then see and understand clearly. Baptism is an authoritative act coming from the very authority of our Lord. It is an act of direction guided by the Spirit of God through the revelation that he's given us in this Word with its purpose to lead men as believing, penitent people that have confessed their faith in Christ to be baptized in order that their sins might be remitted, in order that their sins might be forgiven. So we have three of our words. Now then, let us look at the fourth. The fourth one is the biggest word of all. It has four letters. We've had two words with two letters, one with three letters, and now then we really have a stumper. The whole amount of four letters. Here it is. We go back again to 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. By one spirit we're all baptized in two. There it is. One body. So, in order for one then to be saved, he must be baptized into one body. He's not baptized into some denomination. He's baptized into the one body. What is that one body? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 <clears throat> gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Well, what about that church, which is his body? The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Where is the fullness of Christ found? In the church. How much does it fill? All in all. What does Christ have that's outside of the church? Nothing. But what is that church? One by the body. By one spirit we're all baptized into O N E. One body, not 250, but one body. And in that one body is the fullness of all that Jesus came into the world to bring. That's the reason that in the third verse of that same chapter from which I quoted, Paul said, He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is every spiritual blessing? In Christ. But to be in Christ is to be in that one body, just like Ephesians chapter 1 and the verses 22 and 23 say. Therefore, baptism then brings one into the one body, where the fullness of the blessings of Christ are found, and where all spiritual blessings are found. So I read then in Acts 2.41, They that God received his word were baptized. There were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Acts 2.47 tells us that the Lord added the church daily such as were being saved. Now what did the Lord do? Add them. What did add them to? Add them to that one body of the church. When were they added? When they were baptized. And the word added that denotes a divine action wherein one becomes the recipient of God's grace. And therefore, in order for one to be the recipient of God's grace, he then must be added to this one body. But that takes place when one is baptized, and not before. Now, since Christ adds to the one body, and he adds the baptized, believing, penitent, confessing, believer, to that one body, how then could one be outside that body or not in the church and without baptism be saved? I think when you look at that, you can see that indeed that's an impossibility. But again, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, Paul said, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus tells us the location. 
How are people then children of God? By faith. Where are people children of God? By faith. In Christ Jesus. Who then is in Christ Jesus? Now verse 27. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now look at it. For ye are all, how many Paul? All. What? Children of God. Where? In Christ Jesus. Therefore everyone that has the kind of faith described in Galatians 3.26 is in Christ. Now who's in Christ? For as many. How many? As many. That means just exactly that many, not one more than one less. As many what? As many have been baptized in the Christ. What? As many have been baptized in the Christ and put on Christ. Now who's put on Christ? Every believer that's in Christ can only do that as he's baptized into it. If one's saved before baptism, number one, he's not saved in the right place. And Paul missed it when he said, Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many have been baptized into Christ, put on Christ. So if the idea that one's saved before he's baptized is correct, then Paul was wrong. It's not by faith that brings one into Christ and thereby apart from baptism. But that's not what that passage says. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many have been baptized in the Christ, uh, have put on Christ. But look again. In Matthew 28, <clears throat> Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now mark it. Baptizing them, and I'm quoting the American Standard Translation now, baptizing them in two. That's our word. The name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, in that connection, the phrase in two, and in relationship to all three of those names, denotes relationship. When then is one brought into relationship with God the Father? When he's baptized into that name. When is one brought into relationship with the Son? When is baptized into that name? When is one brought in relationship with the Holy Spirit? When is baptized into that name? Now, if one is saved before he's baptized, he is saved before he is related to God, related to Christ, or related to the Holy Spirit. Is that possible? Do you believe that one can be saved and he is not in fellowship and communion with God, nor is he in communion and fellowship with Christ, nor is he in communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Is that possible? But if one say before he's baptized, that's exactly what happens. And yet Jesus said, baptizing them into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in order that they might enjoy that fellowship. And then again, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we learn that we're baptized into his death. And that denotes fellowship. When is one brought into communion and fellowship with the blood of Christ? When he's baptized. Now, if one saved before he's baptized, he saved without having communion and fellowship with the blood. How can one be saved by the blood and not be in fellowship and communion with it? The cross of Christ brings about, brings one into fellowship and communion and relationship with the blood. Therefore, since the blood says, the blood saves when one is baptized just exactly like the, uh, Romans 6, 3, and 4 say. That we are buried with him 
by baptism into death. King James translation. The American Standard Version said, we are buried with him through baptism. Through baptism where? Into death. When you came into this building tonight, you came through that door. You didn't come through the wall. The door is the entrance into this building. George is through the door. Romans 6 then said, We are buried with him through baptism. Through baptism, where are you going? To his death. Therefore, Paul said that baptism is the door through which one must go in order to reach the blood of Christ. And so we've seen then that into has to do with transition from the outside to the inside. Now then, let me put all three of them back, all four of them back, and let you look at them. Here's what you get. Baptism is related to Christ by authority. All authority has been given to him, and he commanded that. That's what the Great Commission says in Matthew. Jesus said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. And so it's an authoritative command coming from Christ. But in order for it to come from Christ, it had to be through the direction of the Holy Spirit because Jesus went back to heaven. And in going back to heaven then, he sent his apostles out, guided by the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit through them could proclaim the word and lead men to know how to be saved. And therefore it's related to the Holy Spirit by direction. But not only that, it is related to salvation by purpose, the intended purpose. An object of it is to bring the man salvation. It is related to the world by transition. It is by the transition into that one body and from the world into the church. In fact, the word church means the called out. How then are men saved? To the penitent believer, it is upon the confession of his faith, by the authoritative command of Christ, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit guides one through this divine revelation that he gave. And it is for the intended purpose or bring it about the remission of sins, in order that the transition might take place, where one is separated from the world and set apart to the service of God in that one body, which is the church. Is there anything difficult about that? Isn't it strange that the majority of the preachers and guests and tonight will deny this simple lesson that I present to you. And yet there's not a single one that could answer the, a single truth that I present to you. Isn't it strange that people will listen? And I hope this will help us understand the simplicity and the essentiality of this subject. And I trust that we can appreciate more what it means to believe, to repent, to confess, and to be baptized.